Hi there, my name is Kalle and I'm a filmmaker living in this simple log cabin in the middle of nowhere in northern Sweden together with my girlfriend Christine and our two Siberian Huskies, Tuss and Nala. And today I'm gonna answer your questions. But first, let me show you around. So this is the main cabin where we live. It's 115 years old, it's completely uninsulated and we have no running water. And behind me here, you have our garden we just built actually. And up here, this building right there, that's our sauna. And over there is what we call the random cabin, where we put everything that we can't fit in the main cabin. So the very first question is, can you share some of your favorite moments or experiences while living in the Swedish wilderness? There's two moments that comes to mind and it was one of the first summers I spent here and me and my sister was actually sitting in here uh, eating dinner uh, in the living room and I just saw something moving across the lawn behind her and I couldn't see what it was from the beginning and then I actually realized what it was, start running for my camera because I realized it was a lynx, we call it lojur in Swedish and it's a big 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 cat just wandering around here in the forest and people can live here their entire lives without seeing a lynx and I have no idea how I got that lucky to be able to see one just randomly showing up just walking across our lawn um, so that was one of our the coolest moments I've ever been a part of and the second one I think of is me and Christine was actually sleeping in uh, the bedroom and then I woke up by one of our dogs, Nala, sitting in bed and growling, like mm. And I had, like, she never does that noise normally. So I started looking outside the window, and then just below the window, there was a bear. And I was like, I started to like, not panic, but I started like, oh my God, this is not happening. And I was so excited. So I think I said something out loud, like, oh shit, or something like that. And then I scared it away. So I only saw it for like a few seconds and then it ran away into the forest. Next question is how do you get your firewood every year? Well, here it is. In the beginning when I lived there, I cut down all of the trees myself and I spent the majority of my time cutting down trees, cutting down trees, cutting them, stacking them. And it was just very draining. I love cutting firewood is one of my favorite things to do but since I'm spending more and more time making these videos I don't prioritize as much cutting my own firewood so these days I actually buy it from a guy living about 20 minutes away from here he dropped this off just a few days ago and this is seven cubic meters that I now have to stack in there but I'm waiting for two more trucks of this so I'm gonna have 21 cubic meters of firewood and try to fit the, that in here, which I know already is gonna be impossible because the woodshed is not big enough, but that is a problem for the future. How does your family and Christine's family feel about that you're living so far away? Well, um, they think it's a bit boring because Christine family, Christine's family lives about 14 hours away from here and my family lives about six hours away. And I very recently kind of understood how much I miss my family sometimes because they just left the cabin this morning. They've been here for my uh, my mom, my aunt and my grandma that is 90 years old have been here for five days and just go getting up in the morning knowing that they're here having breakfast together doing spontaneous things have really filled me up with energy and uh, normally I get quite drained when I get visitors no matter how close of a friend it is, I still, the energy still leaves my body, it doesn't fill me up. But with my family coming here, I just go, got so truly, truly happy that they were here. And I never thought my grandma would, <laughs> would be able to see this place uh, because she's 90 and it's, I know it's a long trip for her to take. And, um, oh, why do I get so emotional? I just got very, very happy that she was so happy for me to have this place and she was truly excited about... 
truly excited about what we have created here in the forest. Uh, she thinks it's a bit crazy to live on here, but the funny thing is like, that's the lifestyle that she grew up with. Uh, with. She grew up without a, uh, running water, she grew up with a compost toilet. Um, so this is not nothing weird to her at all. To, to her it's just, just normal childhood. So it was so fun to see her experience this place for real. And not just through uh, pictures and uh, videos. So I'm very happy I got to have her here for a few days and, and share this uh, with her. So yeah, as you, can, <laughs> as you can see, I miss my family a lot sometimes and I'm just very, very happy that they got to be here and I see them quite a lot, but I always go up to them. But, uh, <laughs> but that they came all the way here meant a lot. We didn't do that specifically much, we just took walks and ate a lot of good food and a lot of candy and cookies and just... Yeah, I got to show them this place that means so much to me. And... Yeah, I miss my family a lot, as you can see. Whew. I had no idea I would get emotional during this video. Yeah, it's hard living this far away from our families, but the benefit of our work is that we can create videos from wherever we are in the world. So we can take a week off from the cabin life and just go down south to my family or Christine's family. Um, I know in just a few weeks we're going to Denmark for several weeks and we're gonna enjoy being with Christine's family then. So yeah, it's hard to live so far away from them. but. I'm very happy that we have this close relationship to our families that we do have. What kind of plants do you have in your herb garden? Well, let me show you. I finished this project maybe two weeks ago or something. So it's these four boxes and that circle there at the end. But let me show you what we've planted. I'm not exactly sure of all the, <laughs> the English names for the plants, but I maybe can put them on screen later. So this is Thai basil. Over there we have something called dragoon in Swedish. And here we have thyme. And there we have uh, lemon thyme, I guess you would translate it to maybe. And over here we have what we call mynta and this is uh, I guess you say mint and this is peppermint mint maybe maybe that's the correct thing to say uh, over here is oregano and this is basil over here let's see we call this ringblomma like ring flower maybe over here we have frossört and here is something called hjärtstilla and in this box we have green kale right here and then a pumpkin there and then some squash over here I think it's starting to grow a bit here yeah, tiny ones coming to life when I posted the video about me building this herb garden, I actually got a lot of questions about but how are you going to protect your garden from wildlife? Well, at the moment it's not very protected, but my plan is to weave, I think that's how you say it, a sort of fence. So I'm going to put down poles and then in between those poles I will weave or zigzag uh, branches from our forest and that will protect a kind of a fence. But at the moment we haven't had any animals yet, but I guess when they do find it, they will not leave it alone. So the fence is absolutely a, a priority, but I will see when I get it done. What do you do to help yourself to take the first steps when beginning a new project? How do you motivate yourself? And that's kind of a perfect question when we're already here at the garden, because that's a project I pushed 
and pushed in the future for a long time because I didn't exactly know where to start. But I just said to myself one day that I just take the shovel and I start digging and then we'll see how it goes. And I realized that that's truly the best way to do it, at least for me. Because then I realized, oh, okay, it wasn't that bad. Because it's what's keeping us back is usually the thing we have in our head, our thoughts, our mind, that's stopping us and thinking or making us believe that we're not as good as we think we are. Which we are. We're capable of a lot of things. And we should just be able to realize that, or we do realize that when we actually do try. And I don't think it's a matter of motivation, if I have to be honest, it's a matter of discipline. So my best recommendation is just to start. Take your shovel, start digging. How do you feel that Christine and you are able to balance your life in nature with your life with technology? Well, <laughs> I wish I could say that we have a very good balance. But to be completely honest, our lives surround around both nature and technology. I like to say that I have one foot in technology and one foot in nature, because I do enjoy both. But I am in technology more than I want to be. I don't think I would have had any social media if it wasn't for this line of work that I have with YouTube and Instagram. But I do enjoy it at the same time, but I really wish I could, I could work less. But I can't work less because then I wouldn't able do, I wouldn't be able to afford those things I need or want to build out here and to build the future out here with a build out of the cabin and complete the A-frame and all the other projects we have going on. So I want to be less in technology. I want to work less, even though I love. Don't get me wrong, I love making these videos. That's my biggest passion in life. But I still wish I could get more time on each video and I can, yeah, work less. Choose a bit more of my own time when I do just nothing. You know, just go fishing for several days or just stack firewood if I want to do that. Visit friends and family. But now, I don't actually feel like I am even, even able to take a break and that is really difficult because I moved out here to have more free time. Uh, I've chosen this for myself. I mean, I love living in the cabin, I love my filmmaking career, but I wish I could find more of a balance. And I keep telling myself that just give it more time and you will find more balance. But I'm not sure that's true. I think that's going to be a constant struggle because technology is more and more interweaving itself with our lives. So it's kind of hard to be without almost. So short answer, no, I don't think I have a good balance. Um, but I hope I will have a better balance in the future. What are the benefits and drawbacks of isolation versus community when living in a rural setting? Is there anything you would like to change about where you live? I like spending a lot of my time alone. So living like this for myself with Christina and the dogs, of course, is what I really am passionate about and what makes me happy. But what I do miss if I have to change anything is that I would like a big bit of a younger population moving into this area as well. Uh, no hard feelings to, to our neighbors, but most of them are around 70, uh, some of them 60 and some of them 80. But most of them are retired since a long time back. And it will be fun to have some fresh blood into the community. Uh, that's the only thing I'm missing, I would say. I think a lot of you guys have the perception that I am a very isolated guy and not very social. But uh, let me prove you wrong. <laughs> I told you, I can be very social when I want to. How do you make a living? Well, the short answer is that you're looking at it. My main source of income is coming from YouTube. And YouTube is putting ads in front of my videos and after my videos and sometimes in the middle. And that's a, a big part of my income. And I get also get money from um, sponsors that want to sponsor and contribute to my videos. 
and I also get support on Patreon, uh, I sell my own ebook. So all those things combined is my total income. When is the next episode of your podcast coming out? I have a podcast called My True North. It is a podcast where I sit down with a fascinating individual who has been brave enough to go after what they truly want out of life. To answer your question, hopefully in a few weeks. I have invited four more guests that have agreed to come on the podcast, which I'm very, very excited about. And I know you are also going to be excited about those guests. So short answer, soon, I hope. But it's a bit hard to find the time to do both the podcast and YouTube and this line of work uh, or lifestyle in general. But I love the podcast and I'm going to work on it as fast as I can. What does your medallion symbolize? I wear this medallion every single day. It's a piece of metal and then some birch bark on top or in the front. We call it näver in Swedish. For me it's basically just a pretty medallion to have. But I love the circle as a symbol. Uh, Ida, that was on my last video, he, she talked a lot about that she loves the symbol of a circle as well because it symbolizes a circular life. You know, there's no real beginning and end, it's just circular and I think a lot of things in life work that way. And I always thought about making, like producing or crafting a lot of these, or a bunch at least, as a batch and then selling them. Uh, but I have no idea if you guys would be interested in something like that. So if you would like a medallion like this, please post a comment and yeah, then we'll see if we can make it work. Next question is about how the A-frame is coming along. So let's head into the forest and I will show you. Here it is, my lovely, lovely A-frame. This is going to be my studio and office in the future. So since the last episode I did on the A-frame, we have done the installation now. I picked up the door because that one is not really working as a, <laughs> as a door. And under here, I've actually gotten the, the roof delivered. I can show you to you how it looks like. It's going to be covered in these tiles, if you call them that. We call them spåntak in Swedish. Like all traditional church, church roofs. So this is what it looks like from the inside. It's a bit messy since we did the, the insulation. Here it is. Triangle window over there. Three big windows in this, this direction. And down, I don't think you can see it, but in that direction, that's where the main cabin is. And a lot of people have the perception that this is a very small cabin, but I don't know if you can pick it up on the camera, but it's <laughs> quite big. I have no chance of reaching the roof. So for me, it's the perfect size. While we're walking back to the main cabin, I might as well just answer the ne next question. And that was, what is your experience with mosquitoes and how bad is it? Well, there are quite a lot of mosquitoes. It's depending on how much is raining or on how dry it is. Right now it's okay, but I don't know if I'm getting more and more used to the mosquitoes up here for every year. Because I remember in the beginning I had a, almost like a panic when there were so many around me and sitting on my face and I couldn't sleep. And But now I, I don't get that bothered anymore. But for some weeks, usually in the beginning of June, it's almost impossible to walk outside because they're just on you. You can feel them <laughs> like sitting on your skin. You can hear them and it just, that's hard to ignore. But I have to say at this point of the summer, it's not that bad. Next question is, have you ever thought about giving up on your lifestyle? Yeah, <laughs> many, many, many times, but not for real, real. But the feeling when you're standing in like minus 25 Celsius degrees and it's just snowstorm and you have to go outside to take a shower or it's a hot summer day and you have to empty the poo bucket. 
there's a lot of things that is I would wish or I'm hoping for in the future it's gonna be a bit more convenient. But I would never actually quit this lifestyle. But in the moment when you have those really shitty days, I think you know what I'm talking about, you just wanna throw in the towel and say, no thank you. I'm done. I quit. I tap out. But it hasn't come to that yet, at least, and I don't think it will. But of course I have times that I feel like, what am I even doing? Like, why? Why am I putting myself through this? But what it comes down to on, at the end of the day is that this lifestyle makes this is way more meaningful to me and it makes me truly happy. What would you tell your 17-year-old self about life? I think I would say that you think that adults have everything figured out. I'm 35 now, so I would put myself in the adult category. And I would say when I talk to friends, family, even have a conversation with myself, I realize I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just trying to figure it out along the way, like along the way of the life journey. So if you're 17 or if you're a teenager at all, don't think that we have everything under control. We're still trying to figure it out that we're never gonna actually crack the code in some way. I think that's part of life's journey to like not exactly know what's coming around the next corner. And for me, that's exciting, but it's also important to know that there is no one really with the correct answer out there. So you just, you just have to create uh, your own, I think. And one other thing is that I would say to my 17 year old self is that don't take everything so seriously. Do what you think is fun. Go for the education that is not, the, don't go for the correct education or the correct job. Go for the one that makes you happy because that's what gonna push you forward in life and makes you feel excited when you go up in the morning. Aim for happiness and not what other people are expecting of you. How did I find my dream cabin in the forest? Well, the very short answer is that I found it online. I searched for log cabins that was for sale and I started looking up north because I wanted a different scent, uh, different way of mentality in people and I wanted a different kind of landscapes. So where I grew up there was a lot of forest as well, but I needed, you know, raw nature that was, there was no neighbors, there was actual real forests, there were mountains around me. I didn't have that growing up. So I wanted something different. So I found it online and uh, the guy that I've had it before or everyone that has owned it, <clears throat> owned it before me has only used it as a summer house because most people have seen it as a unlivable situation <laughs> during the winter. Uh, so the guy that I bought it from was a bit questionable when I said that I, would, my, that I might move in here permanently, but I'm very happy I did. What do you do in case of an emergency? And that is a question we get a lot because there's actually not, not exactly a hospital around here. But a half an hour away from here is a town called Soleftio and they have a hospital with an emergency department. And we, we've been at that hospital several times, uh, visiting it for small or big things. But when it comes to emergencies, I don't think it's that far away. Uh, we have a car, it's, we're connected to the roads, we can just drive in. But I realized how tough it can be when I was sick here. Was it last spring, I think? I got the really, really bad flu and I was stuck in bed for over two weeks. And Christina was in Denmark and I had no chance of even leaving the bed. Uh, I can admit that I actually, <laughs> I opened the upstairs window and peed outside of that because I had no energy going down the stairs and going outside peeing. And um, that's how bad I was. But that's why I love this kind of area. There is about a 20 minute walk to the closest neighbor. But we are in, you know, not constant contact, but we are very good friends. So I just called them and said I'm sick. Uh, and they were kind enough to come over with food and supply me, supply me with, with whatever I needed. And that's what I love about these kind of neighborhoods, neighborhoods out here, because People are actually willing to help and people are so friendly and I never experienced that living in a city. 
of course there are friendly people in a city. I get that and I'm not saying the opposite. I'm just saying that I've never experienced this sense of community since I moved out here. Were you able to solve the water situation? We have a pond right here on our property that supplies us with drinking water and showery water and that comes from a cold spring up on the mountain and during August, us August usually it kind of slows down or it's even st stop pouring from the mountain but this year it started in June and the water hasn't come back yet and I have no idea why. So it's kind of a problem when you don't either have drinking water or showering water. I mean, I can go down to the lake, that's only like 400 meters to get uh, showering water and just take a swim there. But drinking water is a bit trickier. Now I get it from Christine's parents' house. That is a bit of a, like what could be, 30 minute walk from here. That fill up small bottles and bring here, bottle by bottle. And it's a bit annoying. So I'm gonna spend the next few days trying to hike up the mountain and actually trying to find where the problem could be because it has been raining a lot. So it should be water right now, but there isn't. Why did you choose to live in a cabin? Well, I bought this place actually as a summer house to begin with. And I only picture myself being here on the weekends or going here on holidays. But the more time I spent here, I just felt more and more happy. And I came to a breaking point where I was like, I'm not happy in the city. Like when I was here, this is true happiness. I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but I think it was the feeling of freedom, not having any, not having any neighbors whatsoever. And it's just completely quiet. I don't know, it just feels like this is how we're supposed to live. I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't think we're supposed to live in, like, packed together in a city, in small apartments, and... Yeah, that's not for me at least. But, I don't know, it doesn't need to be a cabin in the forest, but this makes me happy for some reason. And if it's a bit of a struggle sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> Almost every day there is something that is a struggle, but it's still worth it. Are you happy with your life? I mean happy that you can just look forward to a new day without any concerns about the future. No. Because I think if you're expecting to be happy all the time, every day, I think you're setting up yourself to fail. I think life is supposed to be struggles. I think it's supposed to be failures because it's life. It's not supposed to be happy all the time. A relationship is not supposed to be happy all the time. You're growing with your failures, you're growing with your struggles. The point is not being happy, the point is life. Being a part of this journey is what it is. But yeah, I'm happy with the choices I've made in life. To move into this cabin, to go after the career on, on YouTube as a filmmaker, like before. But yeah, I'm happy with the choices I've made in life. I'm happy moving to the cabin, I'm happy going after my filmmaking career, I'm happy for my relationship with Christine. All the things I'm happy for, but that doesn't mean I'm happy every single day. I think I'm actually more unhappy than I'm truly happy. I don't know, I don't want that to sound very depressing, but I think when I'm struggling, I'm actually evolving um, at the fastest paced pace possible, because I want to grow as much as I can as a human when I have this time on, on earth. So yeah, I'm happy when I wake up in the morning, but I don't expect to be. I have to fight for it. Thank you so much for watching this little Q&A video. And if you have any more questions, just let me know in a comment down below. And until next time, I hope you guys take care and I'll see you in the next video. Next question is... <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, my name is Kalle and I'm a filmmaker here. Hi there, my name is Kalle and I live here in. But first, just let me. Thank you so much for taking. The supply us with drink while we're more. <laughs>